Uh, good afternoon. It is 4 p.m. Today's update will first um, be focused on recovery and updates from the deadly tornadoes that hit Western Kentucky just a little over two weeks ago. Then we will move toward to our COVID uh, update. But today's tornado update starts with uh, tough news. Tragically, today we're announcing another death has been confirmed. And this is one that rips at the very fabric of who we are. This is a, a loss of another young life, an infant from Graves County. Brittany and I ask everyone to join us in lifting up this family and their friends and the community in prayer. It happened about the middle of last week, uh, but added in our death count where our fatalities now stand at 77. We've also had an amendment to uh, the major declaration uh, by the president. Marion County has been added to the disaster declaration for individual assistance and public assistance, now bringing the number of counties that qualify to 16. That means residents in Marion County can now apply for FEMA assistance. So let's go over how to apply for FEMA assistance again. First, you can do it online at disasterassistance.gov. Second, you can do it through the phone, 800-621-FEMA. That's 800-621-3362. You can download the app. You can also uh, go to mobile registration centers in Christian, Graves, Hart, Hickman, Hopkins, Logan, Lyon, Muhlenberg, and Ohio counties. Finally, there are FEMA folks that are working their way through neighborhoods. You can work with them directly. These ways not only help you file your claim, but ultimately help you follow your claim. And I believe we've been doing collectively as a state, community, and the rest a pretty good job. We have 11,400 validated registrants, and that number will grow. So, you know, it's, it's good and bad. It's good that that many people are getting signed up. It's a question I ask each of these folks when we see them. It's really tough that we know more than 11,400 families have been significantly impacted by this tornado. It's about 11,600 insurance claims that we know uh, have been filed to date. Um, and FEMA is getting dollars out faster than we've ever seen. A little over $4.7 million has gone out thus far. Three additional disaster recovery centers have been opened to bring the total number to seven. These are permanent. Uh, well, these are, are, are places within these communities that you can go to talk to FEMA as well. The new locations are in Fulton, Marshall, and Graves counties. Those are in addition to the mobile registration centers. Remember, if you have homeowners or renter insurance, you must first file a claim with your insurance agency. And what FEMA does is cover damages above and beyond that. Make sure you file both claims. Uh, debris removal remains a key priority, and it is really starting to ramp up. We are working with our federal partners to remove debris from our neighborhoods, roads, and highways as quickly and safely as possible. Counties have identified and continue to identify approved location for debris to go, and county and city leaders are working to ensure program understanding and compliance, while at the same time securing contracts to remove and monitor debris. Kentucky Parks Update. Our Kentucky State Parks are providing housing and food services for 606 displaced Kentuckians and 154 first responders. We have 208 state park rooms occupied by displaced families and 81 rooms occupied by first responders. New website. This was important. Last week, we launched a convenient, easy to access online resource to assist Kentuckians affected. Here it is. The website is located on governor.ky.gov, uh, just as backslash tornado resources. We want to make sure that every individual and family in Western Kentucky knows all of the different resources that are out there, where to go, and who to talk to, and we've tried to put it in one easy location to access. 
these are things like um, lost property, employment, transportation, important documentation. Again, any and every service that is out there, our goal is to get it on this page so you can look in one place. The website provides a listing of information from a large number of state government assistance programs, including many on the topics we're talking about today. Again, the address is governor.ky.gov backslash tornado resources. Food benefits. This is new today. Uh, we haven't quite gotten our disaster SNAP benefits yet, though it is moving faster than we have ever seen. But three waiver updates that will help people that are currently getting food assistance. Through a special waiver for current SNAP beneficiaries, they can request benefit replacement by calling the Department of Community Based Services at 855 306 8959 or visit their county's DCBS office. So if you currently get SNAP assistance, you can request your benefit replacement by calling 855-306-8959 or visit your county's DCBS office. Benefits are available through a waiver approved by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Services. Replacements can be requested until January 8th, so you want to get on that quickly. A second waiver has also been approved. It provides automatic replacement of December benefits to some residents of Warren and Hickman counties, Mayfield, Dawson Springs, Auburn, and Pembroke. A third waiver has also been approved. This one allows the purchase of hot food from authorized SNAP retailers with their benefits. Under normal circumstances, it can be tough to get hot foods with those benefits, but Kentuckians in 30 counties may make hot food purchases through January 17th, 2022. More information is going to be posted on that uh, uh, Governor Tornado Resources website. All right, workforce investment. Uh, residents who temporarily or permanently have lost their jobs because of the tornadoes that swept through Kentucky are eligible to receive disaster relief assistance. U.S. Department of Labor has approved up to $25 million to assist dislocated workers in Kentucky with a first distribution of $8.3 million to the Commonwealth. The federal dislocated worker grants are available in the FEMA declared disaster area, which includes Caldwell, Fulton, Graves, Hopkins, Marshall, Muhlenberg, Taylor, and Warren counties. More information will be forthcoming and we'll be working with the local workforce development areas to get information out. Next, disaster unemployment assistance that's available. Individual who became unemployed or those who are self-employed and have work interrupted in 16 Kentucky counties as a result of these tornadoes are eligible to apply for the DUA disaster unemployment assistance benefits through the Kentucky Office of Unemployment Insurance. Uh, these again includes Caldwell, Christian, Fulton, Grace, Hart, Hickman, Hopkins, Logan, Lyon, Marshall, Muhlenberg, Ohio, Taylor, and Warren, and Barron and Marion counties were just added to the list that are approved for this assistance. We've updated locations for this week's disaster unemployment insurance clinics. So today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, that's December 27th, 28th, and 29th, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., except for Madison and Mayfield, which is 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., we have sites to help people at 262 Scottsville Road, which is in the Greenwood Mall uh, in what's the old Sears store in Bowling Green. We actually did a vaccination clinic there. 56 Federal Street in Madisonville, 233 Ring Road in E-Town, 3108 Fairview Drive in Owensboro, and 1220 Eagles Way in Mayfield. It is not necessary to attend an in-person session, which these are being held, but we've learned over the last two years that in-person help in filing an unemployment claim or a DUA, disaster unemployment assistance claim, is really important and helpful. So make one of these sessions. The deadline to apply is January 18th, 2022. And remember, you have to apply for regular unemployment first. This is primarily for people who would not qualify for it. So you get denied from the regular unemployment, and then you can qualify for the disaster 
unemployment assistance. For more information, visit kcc.ky.gov. All right, transportation cabinet. Um, and this is information about driver's license. Again, folks have lost every bit of documentation they have. This is one of the most important ones to get up and going. So a portable pop-up driver's licensing team began operating this morning in Dawson Springs City Hall to issue replacement or renewal driver's license and ID cards for tornado survivors. Tomorrow, the pop-up team will move to Hopkins County Central High School near Erlington and return to Dawson Springs on Wednesday, the 29th. Also tomorrow, pop-up licensing team will be at Penny Ralph Forest State Resort Park. We know so many families are there. We wanna bring as many of the services directly to them as possible. The first pop-up team sent into a disaster area is still operating in Mayfield. It issued 53 replacement or renewal credentials last week. Remember that address is 355 Charles Drive. Again, that will be on the new website that lists uh, everything that's out there. As a reminder, we're waiving the fees for replacements. You shouldn't have to pay for a new driver's license because a tornado took all of your documentation. Department of Insurance is joining the unemployment insurance officials and transportation cabinet to provide a one-stop service at Penny Ryle State Park, December 28th to 29th, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's central time. So that'll be the transportation cabinet. You can get a new driver's license. Department of Insurance is there to help you and the unemployment insurance officials to file your claim or your DUA claim. You can do it all at the same time. Our goal is to make that happen. A uh, few other pieces of news. Uh, Small Business Administration. Right now, I believe 174 applications have been received. All uh, displaced Kentuckians who wanted to be uh, out of a congregate shelter are now out of one. That means we put them in a hotel or we've put them in a state park. There are about 11 individuals that wanted to stay in one of the congregate shelters. And I mean, it, at this time, if that's where they want to be and that helps and in, in, in where they are right now, uh, then good. We want to support them. Uh, but especially in the midst of a pandemic, getting folks into their own room and in a place where we know that there's a big support system around them was critically important. Uh, and this was pretty fast to get folks into um, a less temporary shelter. Uh, now we're going to take care of them while, while we have them, and we're going to work on more permanent housing as we move forward. Uh, we are 83% complete on bridge inspections that may uh, or may not have been impacted by the tornadoes. All state roads are passable. Only three county roads at this point are still closed. All wastewater systems are operational. One system has limited operations. Uh, all systems for drinking water are operational, but there are service connections that are without water. Looks like about 26% of Graves County still without power. It's under 1% anywhere else. And this was an important note that was probably too far back in the report that I get. Um, behavioral, emotional, and spiritual care teams have made over 4,000 contacts in the region, and they continue to provide emotional and psychological support to displaced or distressed individuals. We got more than 148 mental, behavioral, and spiritual care responders working in the impacted communities. And this is so important. I mean, the level of trauma is hard to describe um, with these families. Many of them were already struggling with the neighborhoods that were hit. And when you don't have much and a tornado takes what you have, it could be even harder. There's some families that were dealing with trauma before uh, this hit. But as you, as Brittany and I have gotten to know many of these families, um, you can see it on their face. And you try to find that moment where you say, we've got folks here uh, that you can talk to. And we hope everybody reaches out and gets the help they need. Now for a little bit of positive news. Thanks to the generosity of people across the country and right here in Kentucky, the families and counties impacted have received an overwhelming amount of donations. The Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund, now at nearly $30 million, 130,491 donations. It's truly extraordinary. We've issued 39 funeral expense checks so that families don't have to front 
uh, that money to grieve with us over their lost loved ones. If you're interested in that fund, 100% of the proceeds go to those directly impacted by the storm, and it's wkyreliefund.ky.gov. Uh, the second thing we're going to do with this fund is for uninsured homeowners. Now, FEMA has that limit that it's going to run out pretty quickly, 37900 We're going to add 10% on top, and it has to be for expenses not covered by FEMA, and everybody's going to have to attest to that. Um, but we want to try to try get that level up to a point where you can actually replace your home. And we challenge any other fund out there. Match us. Put 10% on top of us so they could have FEMA. And then the 10% we're adding. And then dollars on top of that. But this fund is for the long haul, right? We've got a lot of great organizations on the ground now. And they're going to have to be on the ground in other places in the immediate aftermath. But rebuilding these homes and structures and lives is going to take years. And we've got to make sure when support is needed down the road that we have it, it's there, and we can deploy it uh, quickly to help these families. Now, here to share some more positive news, First Lady Brittany Bashir. I know you. Good afternoon. I hope this Christmas you each got to feel a little bit of light and joy after the dark and challenging days our state has had for the past few weeks. This whole weekend, Andy and I were thinking about the families who would be hurting this Christmas, those who've lost their home, and especially those who've lost a loved one. But Team Kentucky, because of your incredible generosity, we got the best Christmas gift possible, knowing that you brought peace and hope to our children going through the most pain. You helped Santa so he could make their holiday special, even if Christmas looked different for them this year. Through the Western Kentucky Christmas Toy Drive, thousands of donors from all across Kentucky and even across the country took the time to provide hundreds of thousands of toys for children of Western Kentucky. They also contributed thousands of dollars in gift cards, which helped provide presents for teens and will continue to help families get back on their feet. In less than one week, you gave millions of dollars in in-kind donations to help provide financial relief to parents at Christmas time. The true value of this initiative can't be measured with a dollar amount, it can only be measured in smiles like this. Because of you, we reached every single family who contacted us before the end of the toy drive to ask Santa for a little extra help this year. We even helped some additional families on Christmas Eve itself after the drive ended. None of that would have been possible without the tireless work of our volunteers. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all of our volunteers and stick with me because it is an incredible list. The Kentucky State Police, Kentucky State Parks, the Kentucky trucking industry, Miss USAL Smith, who is a proud Kentuckian, Coach John Calipari, and the UK men's basketball team, who donated 5,000 shoes with Samaritan's feet, local and national journalists and outlets that helped spread the word about the drive, the Fayette County Sheriff's Office, the Jessamine County Sheriff's Office, Paducah Police Department, the St. Matthews Police Department, the Kenton County Police Department, the Litchfield Police Department, P. Rats, the City of Covington, the City of Lexington and Consolidated Baptist Church, the City of Louisville and Broadbent Arena, Kentucky Venues, Hope House, the Green River Educational Cooperative, the West Kentucky Educational Cooperative, the Kentucky Department of Education, Owensboro Independent School District, Davies County School District, Rowan County Schools, Madison County School District, many other K-12 teachers and staff from Kentucky's public schools, the Silverton Oregon Firefighters Association, Northeast Christian Church, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Meyer, Kroger, The Lee Initiative, Stax Barbecue, and Frankfurt. And once again, thousands of donors across the country, including large groups who brought toys from Indiana, Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama, and Arizona. I also want to thank my staff, 
and Andy's staff as well, because this, the coordination to get this accomplished was no small feat if you, um, given this list of incredible volunteers. Um, so thank you to them as well. And then the biggest thanks, of course, Santa Claus. So many people helped with this effort, and I know I'm sure I've left some of you out, but each of you are truly appreciated, and thank you so much. Together, we showed the world that the true meaning of Christmas isn't what you receive, but the joy of giving. We have enough toys left over that we'll even be able to be giving many of the impacted children additional gifts for their birthdays. If you contributed to the toy drive and want to continue helping these families into the new year, there are two main things you can do right now. First, donate blood, as our state's blood supply is critically low after the tornadoes. It's simple to sign up at redcrossblood.org. You can save a life. Second, you can still contribute to the Team Western Kentucky Relief Fund at teamwkyreliefund.ky.gov. will help meet critical needs of the families as they rebuild their lives, as Andy just mentioned. We will continue to update you if additional in-kind donations are needed for these families on top of monetary contributions and blood donations. Thank you for making the toy drive an incredible success. When we come together, Team Kentucky can do anything. Happy holidays and wishing you all the very best in the new year. I'm very proud of our first lady and I'm very proud of this country for the way that they have shown us love, responded to these families in many ways, made their Christmas uh, their own. And we got some folks who I'm gonna mention a little bit later from out of state that spent their Christmas right here, trying to make sure that uh, we were safe and that our families were taken care of. And that seems to be, to me, uh, the true meaning of Christmas. And something that is not in the Christmas spirit, we'll now move to our COVID update. Uh, first, uh, Omicron is increasing significantly across the United States. While we have not yet seen that major increase here, it is hitting other places like Maryland, uh, which uh, its curve looks like a line going straight up. Uh, multiple hospitals now overrun in the area. Positivity rate jumping to almost 16% uh, there. We're seeing this in a number of states. Not all of them will see the hospitalization rate increase as dramatically, but even uh, in some states where it had been low, it can increase uh, very quickly. Um, at least the good news for now is we are not seeing the same type of increase yet. Uh, it remains to be seen exactly how much we will see. Uh, we were hit harder with Delta, what, months ago, uh, just coming out of it than many of the places that are seeing the significant numbers uh, right now. So we'll really need to watch carefully and we really need to be careful uh, as we move forward. Obviously, the best thing you can do to protect yourself from uh, Omicron, uh, to keep our kids in school, to keep everything uh, thriving, not just open, is get vaccinated and get your booster. All the studies have shown that that holds up really, really well against this variant. If you are unvaccinated, it is one of the most contagious viruses we've seen in 100 years. That ought to be startling enough to get vaccinated. So I'm going to go through our numbers of cases and deaths starting on the 23rd. Um, that'll catch us up uh, from days we did not report. So the 23rd, 2,878 new cases, 39 deaths, including a 44-year-old woman from Kenton County. 24th, 2,847 new cases, 44 new deaths, and that includes a 42-year-old man also from Kenton County. Christmas, not supposed to lose people on Christmas. 1,946 cases, 34 new deaths, including a 46-year-old man from Hardin County. Again, primarily Delta is killing people in their 40s at a rate we have not seen before in this pandemic. Yesterday, the 26th, 
981 new cases that may be impacted by reporting. We'll see in the next couple of days, 22 new deaths, including a 49 year old man from Lincoln County. And today, 1,342 new cases, 17 new deaths. Um, and we'll, we'll look at the stair stepper chart in a minute. So where we are in terms of cases right now is pretty stable from the last three weeks. And we'll take that compared to what others are seeing. It is still too high. But what we are seeing in other areas is Delta will, I mean, Omicron, when it hits, if it hits, will increase those numbers precipitously in, in a much smaller time period than Delta. And remember how fast we went up for Delta. Um, one reason for concern, positivity rate now up to 11.8%. You'll see on that stair-stepper chart that that is increasing. So let's look at a case stair-stepper chart. Now, this is really any pre-Omicron hit. When it hits, if the cases go way up, we're really going to have to start looking at hospitalization, much more so than cases, though, again, cases will tell us how prevalent the virus is. And remember, a certain amount of Omicron cases will require hospitalization. Even if, and we have reason to believe that that percentage is much lower than Delta, which was higher than Alpha, um, it's still if the overall number of cases is high enough, can be really significant. So as we look at the stair-stepper chart, again, fairly steady for about four weeks, but look at where that plateau is. I mean, it's it's still in a very tough place. We're reporting, what, 40 deaths a day. So still in the midst of a pandemic uh, that is real. Um, we all wanna see those numbers go back down like we had last summer. The way to do that is to get vaccinated and to get boosted. But with the prevalence of disease right now, with Omicron out there, again, our suggestions are get vaccinated, get boosted at work. You ought to be wearing a mask. School, got to be wearing uh, a mask. And when you get together with people, get tested right before you do it. And I think a lot of this next year is likely going to be using rapid tests just to make sure you're a little bit safer. Going to get together with friends or family, have everybody get tested the day before, or if you can get them and they're going to be more out on the market, get rapid tests and have everyone do them when they show up. A whole lot of people did this for Christmas. And I'm actually kind of proud that uh, this last week we saw uh, almost a 10% rise in testing and number of tests. That, that went down significantly at Christmas last year around holidays. This is the first one where it went up. So people really seem to be heeding the uh, advice and the good advice on how to protect themselves when you're going to get together and you want to get together without wearing masks. I get that. If everybody's vaccinated, that's a good step one. Step two is get everybody tested as close to that get together as possible. And remember how far we've come with testing. I mean, we originally there were no tests. And then there were only tests for people who were really sick. I still remember standing here telling people that if you think you're going to make it, don't get tested because we don't have enough. And one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. But now, now you can get tested in an hour. You can get online. You can find a dozen different places that you can get to to get tested. And soon there will be rapid tests that are easily available that you can take at home that's going to help add an extra layer of protection. Okay, so if that's the good news for the moment, that's the not so good news. That is the increase in positivity rate um, on these last four weeks. Uh, remember, we always talked about positivity rate being a leading indicator. Uh, the challenge here is going to be if it's Omicron, it's not going to be, it will be a leading indicator about how much virus we have, um, but hospitalizations will likely be how serious of a surge we're actually in. So let's look at that. Uh, line graphs that we typically look at, hospitalization at the moment, uh, we're holding steady. That is a very good thing with what we are seeing in other places. Uh, ICUs, we are seeing um, a moderate increase. I don't think that this is cause for alarm yet. 
Um, and then uh, Kentuckians on a ventilator. Uh, remember, this is somewhat flat, maybe a small increase, and that typically flat will mean you go up and you go down depending on on reporting. But again, look at where look at where if if we hope we're plateaued, but if we're plateaued, it's where our original surge was that we went through. That's the the seriousness of where we still are. But let's look at the bright side. People continue to get vaccinated. Um, we we continue to talk as a nation uh, about not enough people being vaccinated, but people continue to get vaccinated and continue for the first time. I'd remind everybody that in the course of a year, we vaccinated more people than ever in human history. Pick any state, regardless of how they've done. Um, in one year, more vaccinations, faster based on when we first learned of the virus than ever before. If this virus wasn't so uh, transmissible, uh, we'd be celebrating and we'd be winning. It's just that our adversary is that big of a challenge. But the good news today is over the weekend, 11,071 Kentuckians got their first shot of hope, meaning 11,071 Kentuckians made the decision to get vaccinated. Also a good number, because I truly believe whether we have another surge doesn't depend as much on new vaccinations. It depends more on boosters. 35,296 Kentuckians getting their booster over the weekend. We continue to see a significant uptick in that. Uh, let's just congratulate the top five counties in vaccination, at least one shot. Fayette County now 74% of all residents. That's almost three quarters of every man, woman, and child in the county. Woodford County, 73%. Jefferson, 70%. Campbell, 69%. Perry County, 67%. So in many parts of the state, showing that it can be done anywhere. Uh, let's look at the demographic breakdown that we always do. We now have 2,764,914 Kentuckians that have gotten at least one shot. And that represents, again, 62% of our population. That is 62% of every living being in Kentucky has gotten at least one shot. Those that qualify, right? Because you can't if you're under five. Two thirds of everybody has agreed and gotten at least their first shot. And then 18 years or older, where you can make your own health care decisions, 73%. I made this point each of the times we've gone over this, but people like to, to, to talk about vaccines like they're divisive, that, that there are almost these two equal schools of thought out there. That's not the case. 73% of these would be eligible voters. Uh, these would be adults. These would be people that can make their own decisions. 73% have already gotten vaccinated and more continue to. This is overwhelming support of vaccination. Again, it's just the adversary that we face. We need it to be even more. And if you haven't gotten vaccinated, um, please talk to someone who has that you love and care about. Nobody's trying to make your choices for you. Nobody's trying to bully you into getting things. We just care about you. We know they work. We've seen too many people die or suffer long-term impacts that could have been avoided. Your family members that are pushing you to, to get it done are doing it because they love you. That's the only reason. Not government this, government that. Purely because they love you and they want you to be safe. So, our first number, which ticked up one, is especially exciting. 75 and up went from 91 to 92%. Remember, 91% is great unless you're in the most vulnerable uh, age group that's up there. So we celebrate every 1% that's increased. Uh, the next one is the 40 to 49. That is now up to 70%. Uh, and then we go down to 16 to 17, now up to 49%. And then if we go all the way down to 5 to 11, it's at 16%. So Brittany and I are parents of an 11-year-old and also a 12-year-old. We know these vaccines are safe. Our kids got vaccinated the first moment they could. They are completely fine. Actually, they're better protected, and we take great comfort in that. 
we really need more than 16% of kids in that age group to be protected. That is for them because some small percentage of kids who do get COVID in that age group have really tough uh, reactions or results from it. But the other piece is so many kids, five to 11, have grandparents and other folks around that need to be protected too, and getting them vaccinated is one way to do that. A quick update on our school testing. That is what we put in place that allows people to do things like test to stay. 105 counties using the structure set up by our Department for Public Health, 1,300 schools using it. Here is a really important suggestion. We have a lot of people getting tested right now after Christmas. Good. And if it's hard to get a test right now, I'm sorry, it is still a good sign that so many people want to get tested. That's really taking decisions and responsibility, and that's helpful. But parents, we need you to get your kids tested right before they go back to school. And any school systems that want to do that, right? The same reason that we want to get, we want to test ourselves before getting together with our families ought to apply to kids before they get together with their classmates. Monoclonal antibodies. For the first time in a while, our demand was above our supply. We requested the federal government supply us more. They did. Uh, but that demand increasing does suggest we're seeing at least some more severe illness. Um, again, only one of the monoclonal antibody treatment work against Omicron. Only one. So those that didn't want to get vaccinated relying on the treatment, you could potentially be out of luck with this variant. Um, we've had two pills uh, recently um, uh, passed through the FDA uh, allowable to use. Um, pretty excited about the Pfizer pill and what it may be able to do, but we're going to have very limited doses I think we're going to have 720 total doses over two weeks. That's tough. The other one, which is the Merck, we would strongly suggest that you have a long conversation uh, with any healthcare provider about potential side effects there and what it means as well as its effectiveness uh, before making the decision uh, to take that one. All right. And finally, we don't have a slide on this because I decided as I was walking down here, we have some Team Kentucky All-Stars with us. We have individuals from other states or other areas that have been at our emergency operations center uh, for now uh, over a week. Uh, they gave up their Christmas in their hometowns and with their families to be here with us, protecting us. Um, so uh, we've got uh, Jordan Udis, yes, um, who's from Jefferson County, one of our own. We have Steve Basso, uh, who is uh, from Ohio. We have Katie Brady from Stafford County Fire in Virginia. We have Alyssa Sanders from Nebraska Emergency Management and Jeff Sands from Delaware Emergency Management. We can't thank you all enough. You've been there for us in our time of need. They have helped put together things for this briefing and for other reports. They have been additional eyes and ears to communicate to the public so people know uh, the type of help they can get as well as know how they can help. You all have been amazing help to us. Again, we are grateful and we're going to be there for you in your time of need. We have seen an outpouring of love like nothing we've ever seen before and we're going to spread that love back uh, wherever it's needed. So thank you all. All right. And with that, we will open it up to questions. Three journalists here, a ton on the phone. Um, so I'll give really long answers to the first three questions and see who hangs on the line. So with that, we'll start with Mike. Uh, two part question, Governor. One, can you describe the governor's call with the president today if you were on that call? It was. And uh, two, thousands of flights across the world, thousands of the country have been canceled over mm -hmm. the last few days leading Dr. Fauci to raise the possibility of a vaccine mandate uh, for airline travel. Is that something you would go on? So uh, one question is about Fauci mentioning um, a vaccine mandate for flights. Uh, I'd want to know what it is. I mean, the, the overall employer mandate is not a vaccine mandate. It is a testing requirement depending on your vaccination status. And I guess different terms are used um, depending on, on where you are. For instance, 
uh, with the Sixth Circuit reinstated. They would apply to employers like the Commonwealth. Doesn't require anybody to get vaccinated. It just says if you are not vaccinated, you get tested once a week. Uh, I don't know if that's something he was talking about. Um, I think airlines should look at rapid tests as potentially helpful. I don't know if they should be required, but they would be potentially uh, helpful. But I don't know from the airlines how much of it is a uh, staff issue uh, versus uh, others. Uh, the call with the president um, was uh, a good one. Uh, went over the, the Omicron uh, variant and repeated that it was cause for concern. Uh, but, but, you know, right now, just concern. Um, he pledged the full help of the U.S. military in terms of their uh, medical personnel, uh, as well as additional uh, help through FEMA. Now, we've gotten a lot of that already. Uh, what a lot of people are asking for right now is help that we got during the, the Delta uh, surge. Uh, they're at places they need to be right now. Uh, we're going to try to hold off on asking for additional help until it's absolutely necessary with how hard other places are, are getting slammed. They did that for us. We're going to do that for for them. Um, but everybody uh, talked in a, in a very positive way. Um, and, and one of the big points coming out of it, and I hope it doesn't get misconstrued, is the only solution is one we, we, we work through together. It is not federal. It is not simply state. It's, it's one where uh, together we can get the job done. Uh, Chad. Uh, you talked a little bit about schools and testing. Going before school districts, they have this week still before they go back to class yeah. next week. A lot of them will. In terms of, I know your hands are pretty tied, but any kind of recommendations that you're, you think districts should consider? Yeah. Uh, so recommendations for returning to school. We have seen over holidays that cases can spike. Uh, right now we have uh, the highest transmissible virus, maybe since the measles, uh, meaning that if you go back and you are not wearing masks, that that thing could spread. I mean, it doubles every two days. Uh, could, could spread through your school immediately, and right when you go back, you could be out uh, again. And that's even with tests to stay. It's just the number of people who could get this variant. Then that hits their parents, and that impacts the, the workforce significantly too. So my two recommendations are, number one, set up a program where you can test as many kids before they come back or as parents. Take on that responsibility. That's something that we're going to do. Number two, it, it, you, you got to have universal masking in schools. I get that there's pressure and some folks out there might not like it, but it it's basic science. It's as clear as it can be. I mean, you see what happens before all this with flu uh, in schools. If you truly want your kid to be and to stay in school, this is just something that we have to do. Our kids uh, have been universal masking the whole year combined. They have missed one day due to exposure to somebody. One total day, and we're halfway through the year. That's pretty good. Tom. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I've got a two-parter as well, strangely enough. Um, you, you mentioned about uh, the, the Sixth Circuit. Uh, does this mean that uh, the state government is going to be uh, test to stay? And secondly, any other plans for the relief funds beyond the, the burial expenses and the uh, FEMA stuff? Uh, so on the, the Team Kentucky Fund, we're working through the, the next piece, the Team West Kentucky uh, Fund. Again, we're looking for those that are most in need. The next is likely to be uninsured renters. Uh, but again, so many of the expenses aren't, how am I going to get through this month, right? FEMA can help with that. It's really, once the structure of my house starts going up, what is everything else that we've lost? Um, it's rebuilding entire communities. Uh, it's the the extra help that we're going to need to to wrap around these kids and these adults. So again, there's a lot of help, you know, incident to month two, but month three to month 24 is what I'm really focused on. Uh, the ruling from the Sixth Circuit, I believe, has been appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. If the U.S. Supreme Court does not change that ruling, Kentucky. Uh, will be required to institute what I believe is a testing requirement, uh, the frequency of which depends on your vaccination status. Uh, we've had to prepare for this, whether or not we'll have to 
operationalize it depends on the courts. Um, if it uh, remains federal law, uh, then then we'll have to operationalize it, I think, in the middle of January and we'll be ready. Again, it'll require whatever percentage of state and, and other qualifying uh, employees that have not gotten vaccinated uh, to get tested, I believe, once a week until they get vaccinated. Uh, but otherwise, if they are not, we'd really like to know if they are positive uh, to get them uh, any medical help that they might need. Debbie Yetter from the Courier Journal. Um, with the positivity rate um, approaching 12%, do you have any reason to believe it's not being fueled by the Omicron? And also, um, do you have any uh, idea of what hospitals are facing throughout the state? The hospitalizations are going up in Louisville. So with, uh, with the positivity rate going up, part of it's got to be Omicron. I mean, it's everywhere else. We know it's here. Uh, there, there's no reason to think that any changes that we are seeing aren't driven by Omicron. Now, if our positivity rate is going up, I'd rather it be Omicron than Delta. Uh, because it appears that that it comes with less severe disease. I don't want another spike in cases, um, but if there's going to be another one, again, we'd prefer that it is not uh, Delta. Uh, we are not uh, hearing the, the sound of the alarm yet in hospitals across Kentucky. I know that they are vigilant. I know that they are monitoring, uh, but we do have more systems in place now, uh, <clears throat> especially the connection between our nursing programs and our hospitals to be able to uh, hopefully respond and respond quickly um, as that grows. Uh, Joe Ragusa from Spectrum. Uh, kind of on the same topic, uh, have we seen any particular strain on hospitals in Western Kentucky specifically that are still kind of dealing with the influx of people coming in for tornado related injuries? Have they seen any increased strain as it relates to both that and uh, you know increased uh, hospitalizations due to COVID? So I have not received any reports of significant increase of hospitalization for COVID in, in those Western Kentucky areas. I know we've had a, a few positives in our congregate uh, settings, and that's why we've made sure to get them um, into their, their own uh, rooms. So we, again, we, we're gonna watch it very carefully. Uh, but as of yet, we haven't seen um, a significant rise in hospitalizations. But where it's happened, it has happened uh, really quickly. And I missed part of that question. What was the other part? I'll get it with the next question. Uh, Melissa Patrick. Um, hi, Governor. So uh, CDC data in the New York Times shows that Kentucky's had the largest drop in new cases in the last two weeks today reporting uh, down 44 percent in the last two weeks is there do you have any reason for that can you uh, speak to why you think that that's happening so i think it's too early um for that to 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 be a cause and effect it could just be that 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 over the weeks that'll work itself out but um i i, I do want to see as hard as we got hit with delta and we got hit almost as hard as states to our south. What impact that has on how hard we get hit in this next wave. Some of these waves, as you've seen, have really happened regionally. It doesn't happen all nationwide at the same time. I know that this is a different variant, but whether Delta drove people to get vaccinated for the first time, whether we had so many people that had it, they have uh, higher antibodies at the moment. We know that won't last and they still need to get vaccinated. But, but one question I have is the impact about what we have been through and its impact on what we are going through. I do know we still have enough unvaccinated people that uh, Omicron is going to cause more cases. We expect to cause significantly more cases and that we are likely to, to see a, a rise. Uh, but I'd like to believe uh, that our booster numbers, which are better and fully vaccinated people than in many places in the country, is also playing a, a big role in that. The more people we get boosted, the fewer people get any form of COVID and the fewer people who are hospitalized. Karen Zarr. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Virginia. One on COVID and one on storm recovery. You touched on this, but could you elaborate for those people who really do focus in on the positivity rate as to why we are looking at that differently 
now as opposed to a year ago or even six months before uh, ago uh, with so many people who are now being tested for the holidays. And then on storm recovery, we are about halfway through the president's commitment to pay for cleanup and, and other uh, financial help that we need. How far along would you say we are in the progress of the cleanup and how far do you anticipate we'll be able to get within that deadline? Thank you. We had a long way to go. Uh, we had entire towns wiped out. Um, now, uh, the pace is increasing as the Army Corps come in in Mayfield and other contractors in other areas. They bring larger equipment, uh, which starts to move that debris uh, faster. It's certainly going to take more than 30 days. We'll have another request for the president as we get uh, closer to it. Uh, but we are really grateful about the 100% for the first 30 days. And right, I only think it's good manners to get through at least a significant part of that before he has for something more. Um, but but we're going to need uh, some more help on that uh, for sure. I'm not sure we've seen a cleanup quite like this, especially as located as it is in, in Mayfield and Dawson and some other places. You know, um, cleanup may go faster in somewhat more rural areas where uh, not as many structures were hit, but but you got to look at the demolition that's going to be required in Mayfield. It's going to be really significant too. So it's really hard. And even with what's left to people's homes, it's it's before they can haul it out, they got to knock it down. If that's not awful on people who have already uh, been traumatized. So the positivity rate, if it's Omicron, I mean, if it's Delta, we're not looking at it differently. If the positivity rate's going up and it's Delta, we are greatly concerned. Um, if it's Omicron, then we are uh, concerned, um, but we're not panicked because thus far in every place that we have data, save maybe one, uh, the, the level of disease that it causes is much less severe uh, than Delta. Many less people in the hospital um, and, and we have more people vaccinated. So you look at those two things together and the, the total concern about positivity rate is less, though it's still an indicator that we are watching and, and that, again, it's cause for concern, but not panic. James Pilcher, WKRC. Good afternoon, Governor. Following up on that question, um, do you think the state is ready for another wave if it does get as bad as it was in Delta? Is the state ready for such a large number of new cases and potentially severe cases? Well, it's hard to know how high it will go, right? We haven't seen the peak in some places, though hopefully they've seen the peak in places like New York. Um, it also hasn't, I don't think it's played itself out in places that have gotten hit uh, as hard as we did and as recently as we did with the Delta surge. I believe that uh, we are prepared in our hospitals in new ways. Sadly, going through difficult times teaches you uh, some lessons that you can apply going forward. Um, our regional hospitals are ready to uh, increase, escalate the level of care they can provide because they had to during uh, Delta. They've learned what rooms they can convert into ICUs. Uh, they've learned the practices they can put in place in those critical uh, situations. Uh, we've got better connections now between nursing schools, which, oh my goodness, were such a um, lifesaver in the midst of that Delta surge, providing additional bodies that could do uh, some really good work. Our guard performed incredibly during that time and, and are available if necessary again. So do I believe that we are better prepared? Yes, uh, but what we will see depending on the level of transmissibility and we're also a little better prepared because a few more people are vaccinated. But the number one thing that people could help us do is get their booster if they're vaccinated or get vaccinated for the first time. More people boosted or vaccinated, the fewer people are actually going to the hospital. Uh, April Rickert from WFPL. Hi, Governor. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if you know what percentage of the COVID samples coming in are showing up as Omicron and what kind of uh, what kind of side effects people are seeing from that? So I don't have that number and I will get that. Um, but uh, it's if if a large portion aren't Omicron, 
It's just a matter of time. Something that doubles every two days. I mean, in the next, in the very least, in the next two weeks, it ought to be everything uh, with with what we have seen. Uh, but let me get the number of, of those that come back. I mean, one thing that happens once something becomes the dominant strain through the United States is sometimes not as many of the samples are sent to be sequenced because we know uh, the reality that we face. Uh, Drew Gardner. Hi, Governor. I was just, uh, we have um, several uh, big New Year's events that are returning for the first time since the pandemic began, particularly the Forestry mm -hmm. Live celebration here in downtown Louisville. We know it's going to be a few days before we know what these gatherings at Christmas will do to the community uh, spread in cases. What is your advice to businesses hosting events like this and people who are considering uh, attending them? Do everything you can do outside. If you can, test everybody as they come in or at, at least... Uh, ask them to get tested the day of or the day uh, before. Uh, you ought to think about if if you're hosting an exclusive event, whether or not everybody should have to be vaccinated. That you as a business owner, that is your prerogative, right? Uh, just like many people talk about it's their right to do this or to do that, that is your right, depending on how well protected you want your event to, to ultimately be. Uh, so all of those things are important. If if you have an indoor part, again, if you're not doing vaccinated and tested, consider masking. Because it, it's 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 like a get together with family, right? And the smaller your New Year's celebration, the better. Um, but but it's it's two of the three, right? Everybody vaccinated, everybody tested, or everybody masked. You pick pick two of those three, and I know two of them um, uh, could could provide a lot more fun than uh, than the others. Uh, Rachel Droz, WHAS. Hi, Governor. Um, two years into the pandemic, we're starting to see issues with testing access again, and it's something many of us haven't dealt with in quite a while. Um, I personally went out today trying to find at-home tests and didn't have luck finding a single one. Mm -hmm. Why are we seeing this, and have you been in communication when, with any of the pharmacy leaders to get more tests sent here to yeah. Kentucky? So this is going to be a short-term issue that's going to be addressed um, very soon uh, by the, the, the U.S. government's purchase of, of more tests. So a couple things are happening. Number one, right now, after Christmas, folks are going out in almost record numbers to make sure they are safe, and that's a really good thing. But just the, the total amount versus what you normally see in a week is, is leading to uh, what you're experiencing. But the second piece is people are seeking a different type of tests, right? You could get a PCR test likely today if you're willing to go to uh, a pharmacy or a location that's doing it. But if you want a you know take home test, there are fewer of those than PCR tests because they're newer. Uh, they haven't been on the market for all that long, um, though they are increasing. So what we're seeing right now for those take-home tests is a lot of the ramp up that we saw earlier in the pandemic about PCR tests. So again, you know, we are building a new supply chain in new ways and in new versions almost weekly. It will catch up in that area. And I actually believe that it may get so robust that at least this year, and it's not forever, it's probably just this year, uh, we'll have the opportunity in the months ahead when we're gathering with people for everybody to do a rapid test when they show up. Make sure everybody's safe at that moment. It'll give us new tools to be uh, more flexible and enjoying time around one another. But until that's possible, continue to try to be as safe as you can. Listen, we can do this. We know enough about this virus, about how to protect ourselves. We have life-saving vaccines. We have boosters to stay highly immunized. There's no reason uh, with masks, we shouldn't be able to have our kids in school every day, that our economy can't continue booming uh, like it is right now. There is no reason that we can't live with this virus even the way it is right now. But we all have to be willing to use the tools that God has given us to protect ourselves and, and one another. And if we do that, we'll beat it at the same time. So next update is on Thursday. I hope everybody has a good week. Um, 
make responsible plans. Is our next update not Thursday, Crystal? Okay, our next update is next Monday. That's my New Year's present to everybody out there. We'll make sure that we put out uh, a video with any additional news that you need. Thank you all.